Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I am so, so, so excited. I have my friend, Kelly Teal, back. I'm so happy to call you my friend. And this episode, what we're doing today, actually, we were having a conversation just on the phone, just as friends do. Kelly, as many of you guys probably have gathered, is a weirdo just like us. So... <laughs> <laughs> so so we talk about all sorts of stuff on the phone and we were talking about I forgot how it came up Kelly we were talking a lot about like the process of um of like grief and leaving and we talked a lot about I know you guys if you're new to the show or if you if this is your first time catching the show Kelly Teal is an awesome human being who survived Nexium. that's just something she did it's not all of who she is and I'm really excited for more and more and more of you to come out Kelly as you get out there even more because even though that's kind of been like the platform you've been using to talk about your story there's so much more to you than just this one time period of your life but if you guys missed the first episode that I did with Kelly I will put that down in the description box below plus the episode that Kelly did with our friend Catherine Edwards as well so you can kind of get caught up on who this beautiful lady is and what she has done with her life post Nexium. And Kelly, we were speaking, I think we were talking about like so many people are so fascinated, myself included, by like cults and like what happens to get somebody into that situation and then what happens in the aftermath of getting out. And so many people I feel like are missing a, a really big chunk of the of of the reality of the experience, and that's the humanity of the experience and the grief of the experience. And, and in saying that, I will say I think there is a huge demographic of people who do get that, and that's why they're interested and intrigued by these stories because they can relate to that that um that experience of of going through loss like that. And so um, let's start there because you've said some really really powerful things off camera about your experience of, of like decluttering your mind coming away from Nexium. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> coming away from leaving Nexium was a process, um, just like leaving any kind of relationship or leaving um, a group or community. And so the first thing that I encountered was an enormous amount of grief. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why I was feeling so sad when I was doing something that I knew was right. But what um, what I came to found out, find out was that, you know, my connection to the community, my connection to my life in Nixium, what, what it had been, was a process. And I had to let go. And anytime, most times when you let go of things, there's grief involved. And so there was many levels of grief. First, there was sort of just the just the kind of the grief that you don't even know what it is. And then the kind of grief that you're thinking, okay, now I recognize this as grief. And then there's the actual like grieving part, which I found, I tried to rush through. Yeah. And oh, it's so uncomfortable. When you it? rush through grief. Yeah. You, when, you can't rush through grief, but when you try, you almost, you make it a, a longer period of time. So I had to lean into the grief and just be with that grieving process of I lost a community of people. I lost part of myself that I actually really liked that was in Nixium. There was a part of Nixium that was really good or I wouldn't have stayed. Right. I lost that. I lost the person that I was. I I lost a part of my life. There's just so many things that were coming through in, in this period of grief. It's and I was saying to you, and I I think I said this to you in our conversation off air, and this is why I wanted to talk about this on my channel because I I'm hoping that this will help people understand the process of getting out of an abusive relationship. For example, it's this, mm -hmm. I mean, Kelly was like the warrior who decided to sold contract to do this in a very public way, <laughs> but a lot of people <laughs> go through it in their private lives. You know, like I, yeah. I think I told you, Kelly, I was in a very narcissistically abusive relationship for my, um, it ended in my early thirties and I had gone through many abusive relationships till it culminated to one night where I was strangled and I had to call 911. And even, mm -hmm. You know, even the mind scrambling after I had that experience for a long time, I kept thinking, oh, my God, what did I do to invoke that? I kept bringing it back to how is this my fault? Because the person who had done this to me had presented himself in a way that wasn't accurate. So I, I, and I think, and I hope that makes sense. Like when we're looking at people like Keith Ranieri or for anybody watching like an abusive husband you've left or wife you've left or a company you've left you're given this this version of this person, the leader or the person you're in a relationship with, 
the CEO of a business that is appealing to you at the time that's part of the love bombing process. And so this projection of this person through your own, your own belief system is created. And then when that falls down, it's almost like you're mourning a death. Like the, 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 mm -hmm. the person of the person. And that is so, and I hope that makes sense. And maybe we can talk a little bit deeper on that because I know that from a, not from a cult perspective, but from an intimate relationship perspective where, and I know this is so common with narcissistic abuse anyway, where they present, you know, they start with the love bombing. And so they've created mm -hmm. a side of themselves in order to hook you in. And it's, I mean, it's so difficult, isn't it, Kelly, to let go of that? Well, the thing is, when you have built this um, ideology or this this meaning around something that you're doing in your life, and then you realize that it was A, maybe not good for you, or B, was completely bogus, right? Then you're left with what? Nothing. You're left with having to rebuild your identity, rebuild your life, rebuild the meaning in your life, all of that. And that is a transition. But during that period of time, and you're letting everything go, and you haven't figured out who you are yet, you're, you're learning who you are through this um, experience. But there is that kind of lag time where you're questioning everything about yourself. Who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? And that's a lot of times when the grief is there as well, because it's all mixed together. Yeah. And so when you leave an abusive relationship or uh, something like a cult, it, it is very, very difficult to sit in that space and be to understand that this is actually good for you, right? Because you almost want to sometimes go back. Like leaving Nixium, I know this sounds crazy. It wasn't, it didn't happen overnight. It happened over a period of time and I was letting go. But there were many times in the first probably year where I was questioning myself. And this is before Keith was arrested. This is before I had all the solid information about him where I thought, gosh, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should go back. And that happens a lot in abusive relationships. You start to second guess yourself because you don't know who you are without that situation, be it the cult, the abusive relationship, you don't know who you are. So no. you're like this almost, I want to say a little lamb, you know, mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out which way to go. And sometimes the other stuff that was so bad is more comfortable than the discomfort you're sitting in, not knowing who you are. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And this is why, I mean, I, I told you, Kelly, I've t I told you this on the phone and I, I don't know if I've said it on air before, but you know, I watch all of these survivors of, I mean, I'm fascinated by human psychology. I'm fascinated and, and we know, and I've said this before, human beings, and this is what Another reason why I want to talk about this, because I see so many people react to stories like Nexium or Scientology or anything, and they're mm -hmm. like, I would never do that. It seems so black and white when you're very far removed from the situation. But what people are understanding is the humanity that's involved. And um, one thing I noticed about you, Kelly, before I reached out to you was out of all these survivors of these of these cults, a lot of them had like backed away from spirituality completely, which I totally understand. I want to make that clear. I get he healing processes have to happen. I get that. But something very interesting about you, Kelly, was that you you kept that part of yourself that was very connected to to source, to spirit, to unit, whatever you want to call it, God, whatever you want to call it. There was that part of you that kind of, and I think in a lot of ways, that's what really from an outsider looking in catapulted you into this amazing healing journey that really sucks i mean it really it's really hard <laughs> to go through um to go through that breakdown and i wanted to i really wanted to really focus on that because that hinge of being out or being in and then being out it's not just an open and shut you're right it takes and this is why so many people stay in abusive relationships. This is why so many people stay in businesses longer than they should. Why it takes, if somebody's in a cult, you can't just go and yank them out. It takes, they have to be willing to leave and it takes deprogramming. It takes all these years of real work in order to sever those ties emotionally within the person. It's easy for me as an outsider to look at Keith Raniere and go, this guy is gross, disgusting psychopath. But when you've been groomed and molded, it's a, it's, they're pulling out a part of yourself to mirror back to you in order for you to stay around. And so it is a part of yourself that has been exploited. And that's why mm -hmm. the, these stories are so unbelievably 
incredible because it does, Kelly is an example of the human resilience. And so let's, can, do you mind Kelly, if we, can we kind of go piece by piece through the grieving process? And I know we kind of spoke about your leaving Nexium in the prior episode, which again, if you guys want to hear the full story, watch the episode, but let's, let's go piece by piece. When you, we know that you, um, you were about to kind of be inducted into DOS, weren't you? Right. When this whole, whole mm -hmm. thing which i think yeah. you have the most badass spirit guides out there <laughs> i know i do i really do <laughs> back it's like you dodged a a big bull i mean you could have you were like yeah. this close to having that brand put on you too yeah yeah uh, i do have amazing guides i i really do because all throughout Nixium, I was very close, like, behind, you know, a doorway away from some pretty bad stuff that was going on. And so I was being recruited into DOS. And at the time when they started to ask for the collateral and the collateral was something that you would give to the person recruiting you to keep it um, a secret. So to keep it confidential. Now, I didn't know what I was trying to keep confidential. I just knew there was a women's group that they were inviting me into. I knew nothing else about it. And when they asked, as for collateral, I felt like, you know, that that just caught my attention, right? I knew that I didn't want to now involve my family. I didn't want to give something that could be later come out that wasn't good because they said you could make things up if you didn't have anything. For example, a piece of collateral might be writing a letter about let's say a family member abusing another family member or, and that was just the beginning of the collateral. And it, it got a lot worse after that, apparently with a lot of other people. So at that time, my all the bells and whistles sort of went off in my body. I wasn't really listening to them, but I was listening just enough to know that let's put this off. So I put it off long enough, a couple of weeks, and then it all it all came out. So um, back to your question about the process. So it took another year for me, or maybe not a year, maybe about eight months, I guess, to really figure out what was going on, maybe not quite that long, maybe about six months to figure out really what was going on and then to decide to leave because we didn't know anything really about Keith. Everything was being kept secret. We didn't actually have the information until he got arrested. So I ended up not joining DOS. But one thing that a lot of people say is that, how could you even have thought about it? Well, I don't even know whether I would have done it or not because it's not that black and white and that's what i wanted to back up because that's what i was actually thinking that people be like well you know you saw collateral you why didn't you you run well i want to like i guess we could step it back even further because we've had conversations offline about and i know this through narcissistically abusive relationships um mm -hmm. where you are conditioned anytime you have like a weird feeling about something in a toxic relationship that weird feeling is going to be like gaslit and dis mm -hmm. dismissed. And so you don't find security where you might have had security in yourself before the before being introduced to the abusive person, whatever whatever form that might take. Now that security system is not sturdy anymore because you've been in, in literal terms with gaslighting, people make you feel like you are crazy for having doubts or having suspicions and um i know we've kind of talked offline kelly about like even let's say like you're in a group and with a bunch of nexian people and you see something that's weird and you went to another member and said hey this doesn't seem right how would they would have, they would have reacted in a different they would have been like you need to work on yourself or like they wouldn't mm -hmm. have actually listened to what you were saying correct and so right yeah, so so much of that that happened in Nixium was gaslighting, mm -hmm. and it was basically making you doubt and trust in yourself, right? So your intuition was, they were telling you intuition isn't scientific because the curriculum was based on scientific data, supposedly, and intuition is not scientific. Can you prove it? So they'd get you to start doubting your intuition, start doubting trusting yourself. Did you really see what you thought you saw? You're asking a question about so-and-so, let's say Keith. Did you really see that? And how do you know that was true? So they start to get you to doubt yourself and not trust yourself anymore. And then your intuition is always with us, right? Yeah. But we can, not we can decide not to listen to it. So all those things were happening. Same with an abusive relationship. It happens over time. And so you start to not see, you may see a red flag, right? Once you see, you might think something's a red flag, you 
could start to doubt that it was actually there, right? right? So especially if all of your tools now are being suppressed. So when people say, how could you? Like we're teaching people now about cults. We, I didn't know what the red flags were going into this in situ situation. Now I know what the red flags are. Now I cannot unsee them. And what we're doing, all of us are trying to teach people about those red flags. So now they can see it going in, but we didn't have that. No. We didn't have this conversation. These conversations were not happening around the time I joined Nixium. So, and, and that is, and guys, again, I'm, I'm, I want to hit this home. This doesn't even, all of these things that Kelly is describing, even though it happened to her on a really big, big platform with like an, within a cult, these are all the same things that happened to me in my narcissistically abusive relationship in a different, in a, in a more intimate package. And that is what is into that. And, and, and I, I, we were talking on the phone, we're talking about like judgment, discernment and with, with, with judgment, I, you, you said it beautifully. We have to look at it as discernment rather. And with discernment, I think there does come that element of compassion of having compassion mm -hmm. for people, understanding that human beings are really complex creatures. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if, if you had signed up the first day for Nexium and all of a sudden somebody's like, give me some collateral for, you probably <laughs> would have been like, what did I just sign up for? Screw you. I'm going back to Orange County. You know, like, you know, like <laughs> exactly. They're smart psychopaths. They're smart that way. Like they're not going to hit you with the hard stuff in the beginning. They're going to almost, it's almost like they're fishing. They, and I know the children of God, they called it flirty fishing where you're mm -hmm. hooking people in through, um, through forms of like love bombing. And something mm -hmm. that's unique with love bombing is a lot of times what they're doing is they're mirroring aspects of you that are really great aspects of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're seeing in them is actually that reflection of you. Um, and so you get to the place and it's, it's just amazing that through all of that, that resilience where you were like, I don't like this co collateral business because all of a sudden other people are now involved mm -hmm. in your decisions without their own, without their consent. But when we were talking on the phone, like about getting um, branded, and yeah. like, what, what would you do? I mean, I've heard so many people say like, I would have run. I mean, you don't know what you would do. You don't know what you would do in that situation with that type of like mind control and brain when this is your, your family, your, your community, right? These are people you trust that are sitting there butt ass naked in a room with you, right? These are so, so we don't, you don't even know. I mean, thank God, Kelly, you didn't make it that far. <laughs> I personally, I don't think I would have been able to handle it, but I don't know that for a fact. I really don't. Um, I like to say that I, I would have figured it out, but because those tools I was talking about, intuition, trusting the self, all of that were so minimized that I'm not sure I would have listened to myself. I don't know. I really don't. I do know that the collateral was definitely a big flag for me and enough to make me take pause. I do know that. So had I gotten further in and given collateral and then was asked to do more things, you know, maybe I would have run and said, take my collateral. I really don't care. Tell everyone I'm a fraud, whatever I had decided if I had decided to do that. So I might have just said, take it and go, or I might have gone farther. No, don't, don't do that. And I might have felt a lot of peer pressure as well from the people around me that were like, oh, come on, we're doing this. You can do this. You want to be more measurable and accountable and more badass. You want to do this. And, you know, so I might have, I don't, I really don't know, but now I know what I would do. Yeah. I have, I now know never to ever minimize those tools that I have that I know are my, my trust in myself and my intuition. I now know that yeah. I had to learn the hard way, but I now know. Well, it. And I think a lot, and I was thinking though, um, I would rather, I'd very rather be branded than be forced to sleep with Keith Ranieri. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I know. Right right. That, but I would rather take that branch <laughs> than have to get naked with him. <laughs> just, uh, I just don't, you know. Um, so hi, Keith, if you're watching from prison. Um, so um, yeah, I'd, I'd brand me any day over that man. But um, but no, it's, it's and, and you think about that as, and I'm saying that jokingly, but there were women that were forced to do things with him that they, and under their, under the right circumstances, they never would have done, mm -hmm. you know, and it's and it's that that you're right and you see that you can see it in the mm -hmm. eyes especially when you watch the brilliant documentaries that you've been a part of and they show pictures from that time you see you see it behind their eyes that there is something something's gone some light went mm -hmm. out right there's yeah. a light that's been burnt out and luckily for a lot of these women now you can see that lights back but but that's that that light that's burnt out now one thing so you know keith Raniere is was the head of this organization he was kind of like 
I know you guys call them vanguard, which I want to be very clear about this with traditional spirituality, traditional practices. The role of a guru, so in, in yoga, we would call it a guru, which means turning a, a master teacher, basically, some turning darkness to light or teaching you how to turn darkness to light. Here's the big catcher too, guys. Gurus don't call themselves gurus. The students call them guru. They don't give themselves that name. But Keith gave himself that name, right? He that yes. he named himself that. And that's a big, big red flag in the spiritual community. If somebody introduced himself to you as a guru, run the other direction. Because that's that's something uh, who we call Guruji never called himself that. The students lovingly called him that, right? Um, but with Keith, I was asking you because, you know, you said on, on I think on my my episode and other um, other episodes with other people that and this is such a big like whoa like got punched for me as well when you talked about that moment I think you were reading the Frank report and you just had this visceral like knowing mm -hmm. all of a sudden that Keith was evil can you take mm -hmm. us back to that point again of when that hit you yes yeah, so about two weeks after I'd been asked for collateral I was at home I was just I'm chilling out probably on my computer and I got a phone call on WhatsApp from Canada from a, a, another member who said, I'm sending you this link and you need to click on it, but don't tell anyone I sent it to you. Um, it's the Frank report. And um, if you tell me one that I sent it, they'll come after me. So I'm thinking, what are you talking about? So I thought, okay, she's somehow lost it. I hang up the phone and of course, I click on the on the link because I can't not. And it comes up the Frank report, which at the time we all knew or we thought that the Frank report was all bogus and was trying to take Keith down and trying to close Nixium and was basically our enemy. And I'm reading this article about women being branded. And I'm like, what is he talking about? And they're naming a few people that I know. I'm like, this is not happening. And then I see the word collateral. And then everything sort of clicked for the moment. It clicked. And... I remember thinking, that's what she asked me for. So I called her, the gal that had been recruiting me, and I asked her if this is what she was trying to um, bring, what group she was trying to bring me into. And she said, yes. And I just remember slamming the phone down and thinking to myself, oh my gosh. And I sat there and it literally came from my right side all the way through my body was this wave of knowingness that I've never felt before. Just it was complete 100% knowingness. Keith is evil. And it went out my body and then came back through. And I was literally just, I couldn't believe it happened. So I'm sitting there. Now, you have to remember, I was totally indoctrinated into Nixium. So the thought that Keith is evil was ev went against everything I believed 100%. But it still was there. So I, I did take pause and I thought about it. And I thought, I can't believe I had that thought. That is just so weird. And then I went along with the process of trying to figure out kind of what was going on. And again, it took a while. So it didn't just like, oh, Keith is evil and I'm done. No, it was just like, oh, wow. And then what I think was happening was my body and my intuition was coming up to the surface in a big way yeah. to wake me up, which it did for the moment. And then um, it was like my guides. It was everything coming through all at one time because it really shook me up. Mm -hmm. And that programming, then backup programming, and and I came wanted, right back. Yeah. I wanted to start with that as well because that is, and I want everybody to put themselves in Kelly's shoes for a moment in your own life. This is a person that you perceive to be like your teacher, kind of like your you like your guru, like this guy that's meeting with the Dalai Lama, and he's so ethical and he's so good, and you know all these things that you have perceived for a, a, a long and this is like your life this is your business this is your community you know mm -hmm. this is your i mean you're lucky kelly you did have family outside of it but th this is this was everything you knew in your world that you had sell, set up for yourself these are people you loved and then to all of a sudden be hit with this realization and then to mm -hmm. reject it you know that's that survival instinct and mm -hmm. I, I remember because I know I know you said it took you it took a while to leave and you were at the trial you were at some some mm -hmm. of the days of the trial correct yes I asked you on the phone because when I was preparing to do my first interview with you before we were friends um, <laughs> I watched the vow seduce multiple times right multiple multiple times just to really hear what these people were saying to have a better perspective and it hit me watching it there's I don't know if it's I think it's in the vow where they're playing the recording of Keith Raniere speaking to Allison Mack about mm -hmm. the branding. 
Yeah. And it is so sadistic. And his voice is so calm and so arrogant in the way he's mm -hmm. speaking about this. And it hit me. And I thought, as someone like Kelly who knew Keith, Keith Raniere, what was your reaction to actually hearing this recording? Now, I, I didn't hear that recording until everyone else heard it when it came out on HBO. Um, I think there was, uh, they alluded to it in some of the court trials, part of the trial that I probably wasn't there. Um, and I had read the documents. So I never actually heard it until HBO came out. And the whole series for me was learning things that I didn't know, putting pieces of the puzzle together. You know, I knew a lot, but I didn't know everything. So hearing his voice say that, because there was always, always a little part of me that was always thinking that maybe, maybe Keith's intent wasn't all as bad as we think it was. There was always that little bit that, you know, maybe, maybe this just got out of hand. Maybe, you know, I knew he was bad. I knew bad things happened. I wasn't doubting that at all. But when I heard his voice, the way he said it and what he said was like, no, no doubt in my mind his, what his intent was. This did not get out of hand. This was all true. This is not something that, you know, he made a mistake. He intended this. And so it was a very, watching the vow for me was so, I mean, I didn't miss an episode. I was waiting for it to come on because it was filling in the blanks for me, like incredibly so. Were there ever moments watching where you felt that those gut punches Oh, so many times, so many yeah. times where I just was like, oh my God, I knew it. I mean, seeing Nancy speaking um, on, on the vow too, and just hearing what she had to say. I mean, Nancy and I, I worked with Nancy a lot. And so hearing her speak and, oh, it was incredible. Yeah. The vow to actually the second part was even more impactful, impactful. for me. Well, mm -hmm. that's, I want you guys to think about that because for us as viewers, we can hear the recordings of Keith Raniere. And if you haven't watched The Vow, you, you absolutely should. It's on HBO and Seduced mm -hmm. and Branded and Brainwashed. I'll put all those links down in the description box. But to hear, I mean, he was such an arrogant fool that he recorded every, like he, all the, they have all these recordings in his own voice of what he mm -hmm. was planning to do. And as somebody who's not in the situation, when I heard that recording, it was like, this guy is a psychopath. Like this, mm -hmm. and he's so calm in the way he speaks about this branding and, and, and realizing what he's asking human beings to do to their own skin. Mm -hmm. I don't even like seeing it done to animals, like to, to see a human being and to have them do it to each other. And just this, the sadism behind it. And it for me as a human being, I, I I was like I I can't imagine that feeling for these women and these men who trusted this man. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to to see the 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 warrants for the arrest, to see the court filings, and to have those moments of like, well, maybe they are just after him. Maybe there's a misunderstanding. But to hear him say those things in his own voice, that's where like you know, a leather meets road. It's like that's where you're like that's him saying it. How heartbreaking that must be this is someone you trusted this is someone that you you thought was helping the world you know mm -hmm. and, and to hear someone and i'm not saying guys and I, I really again i want you guys to listen to this for yourself because people are allowed to make mistakes like it's not like he accidentally like hit rear-ended rear someone with his car like it's not this is like a very sadistic thing to do to brand somebody you know with yeah. your initials um and, and I just, I, I just, at one moment, I just felt like this heartbreak for all these people who trusted him and to hear that mm -hmm. come out of his, and, voice, his mouth. Yeah. And, and, and seduced the four part series on stars also has some, him speaking some pieces of, of, about some other things, which I don't even want to talk about on YouTube. You'd have to see, watch stars to see it. Um, it is. In, it was an incredible process of, of how they were able to get all these things about him. So again, Seduced came out around the same time the vow came out, vow one, and they all kind of covered different parts of things. They're, they're both amazing documentaries. And 
so that was one sort of level of, of processing after the tr actual trial. And then came uh, like almost a year and a, almost a, maybe a year over a year later came about the vow two with even more information of like who's doing what now. So again, you have watching those, you can kind of see the process of other people, and what they're going through, getting out of the cult as well as processing their new lives and everything else. So again, going back to that, leaving a relationship or community or a cult, for example, takes a while. It takes a lot of information, a lot of input, a lot of layers, and it takes a long time to get through it. It's been four years now, almost five years, and still things come up for me, just like anything else, anybody else's experiences. So what I would say would be, any experience that we go through, no matter how traumatic, just be easy with yourself and allow yourself to go through those layers, uh, acquire the information and the knowledge and apply it without judging yourself and not judging others for going through it either. That's what I was going to In any situation. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, you know, it's easy to be, we, we come to earth school, we come here to planet earth to experience friction, right? That's why- yeah. That's why we were the dumbasses that signed up to come to the first place. Um, I was telling Kelly on the phone, it's like, I feel like Hunger Games. I volunteered to strip you. Like, Note to my guys, next time I try to do this, stop me. Like, just be like, no, no, no. You're go, go to Venus this time. You're fine. Um, and that friction, you know, it's, it's so easy to be an onlooker and to place judgment on people for mm -hmm. the decisions that they've made or what they, I mean, I see this with the Scientology people all the time. Like they literally thought they were saving the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, people who yeah. signed up for Nexium, I guarantee you 99% of the people with you in Nexium were fully sold, empathetic, compassionate people totally. who mm -hmm. wanted to help and wanted to help themselves and then help others to, to create a better existence for all of us. Same thing with the Scientologist, same thing with a lot of the religious people. Like it's, yeah. they're trying, they're, they're coming from a place of sincerity where they want to, you know, I, I don't think a psychopath would very easily join a cult because psychopaths usually start the cult because they can't get anybody <laughs> else to praise them otherwise. Right. Like Keith Raniere couldn't get anybody else in the bed with him unless he started a cult. So, <laughs> exactly. you know, um, so, you know, but they don't have that desire to truly invest in humanity. They don't have the desire, the, the, the empathy and the compassion or the love that they want to see the world a better place. And so you do have to have that compassion with yourself and with other people when they're coming out of this situation. Now let's say Kelly, that somebody's watching right now and they have a friend or a sibling or a child that's in a, a narcissistically abusive relationship, which again, as Andrew Gold said, is the cult of one, mm -hmm. what would be the best approach for people to take with somebody in it or in an organization that might be high control? How does, how do people as somebody who would you have reacted if someone came in and said, Kelly, you're in a cult, I'm taking you out right now. What would have happened? Well, of course, I people did actually question whether I was in a cult or not. No, I'm not in a cult. I'm, just, you know, I'm totally fine. And if someone tried to actively remove me, what are you doing? You can't do that. I'm perfectly fine. I'm happy here. There's no problem because there wasn't a problem for me, right? Even though there were things going on that I didn't know about, there wasn't a problem for me. I didn't see it. And so, anyone who's in one of these relationships or communities or organizations that are cult like, first of all. The flags, which I'm happy to send to you if you want to post those or whatever you want to do, um, those flags go for narcissistic relationships as well and for cults. And so trying to get, help someone get out, you don't just like maybe send them the flags, but you can recognize the flags and realize there's an issue here. And then it's a matter of getting help. And the help that's usually available for something like that is, is like an intervention, just like you would have in Alcoholics Anonymous, similarly, only with different resources. And seducedocumentary.com has a whole list of resources. So cult deprogrammers, authors, speakers, people who are involved in the therapeutic part of this, all the resources are there on that website, seducedocumentary.com. And there's other resources, many places, but you can at least get the names of people who were involved in, in this type of thing of helping people get out of cults and abusive relationships. And that's a good place to start. Yeah. And I will say too, it's, it's, you have to understand the fragility of someone's mind at that point, especially if yes. they're in a, in a, in a romantic relationship, mm -hmm. an intimate relationship with a narcissist. 
And the, from my experience, the worst thing you can do is mm -hmm. to like abandon that person to be like, I'm right. just not going to be around with you because you, you know, because they're going to need you. Um, mm -hmm. And they're going to need to know that they have a support system when when they do finally decide to to take control of the situation. And um, I, I know, you know, it, with romantic partners, sometimes that might even be a, a, a bigger clutch because there is intimacy involved. That's yes. not going to be the same. And, and maybe um, a, a community center or something else that's not that's not the intimate part of that person's life. And I see that a yeah. lot with people that have like siblings or friends in an abusive relationship get really frustrated with, with the person that's being abused. But that also is going to add to the stress that that abused person is under. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's a very, I mean, fucked up is the only way I can really describe it with the, with the way that the mind has been, basically the 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 narcissist the cult leader or the the partner has put that person in a position of needing the narcissist of mm -hmm. needing the cult leader mm -hmm. and so you have to understand that and so even though you know they don't need them they think they do and that's right and yeah and they don't feel they need anyone else and so the the really key thing that that you just said is that you need to be there for them when they come around, when they figure it out, when they need help, when they want to leave, because eventually, hopefully they will. And it's sort of like you can't, you don't want to ever, the one thing they always say is you don't want to lose contact with the person, right? And the way to lose contact very quickly is to accuse them of being in a narcissistic relationship and the person that they feel they need the most, be it the cult leader, the community, or the relationship. If you accuse that thing of being person or thing of being bad, that's a great way to cut off communication with the person you're trying to help. Yeah. So it's really key to stay in communication in any way with the person. And then when they're ready, you are already kind of loaded up with information and, and resources and things like seducedocumentary.com page so that you know what to do right away. As soon as that person asks for help, you're able to call someone. And I will say, I have a friend here in Atlanta, Janet, my friend, Janet, she's been my friend for a very long time. She's a, uh, she's older than me. And um, with my situation with my ex, which was like 10 years ago at this point, um, she had been through an abusive relationship herself. So she's out of everyone in my life. She's the one that played it right. Yeah. She would come in and she would say things like, you know, he's really good looking, but I, I can see what you really like about him, but I don't like the way he talks to you. Mm -hmm. are, are you have you kind of noticed maybe maybe i'm catching she was she never really put the blame on him but would kind of bring right. little things to me and Point so when the shit fit, hit the fan and i had to call 911 out i i went to her house and stayed at her house she was mm -hmm. the person i went to mm -hmm. when i needed to get out because i trusted her because she never she never like blamed me or she never she always came from a place of being compassionate towards the situation itself mm -hmm. and i will always forever be grateful to her for that because she understood that if she came in and said you're a freaking narcissist you're tra treating my friend like shit i'm not going to stand up i would have cut her off at that point sure yeah you know because yeah. he had already done his number on me and so that is a really good example of not don't victimize the victim any further than they're already victimized, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so it's it's um that's really important. And I know it's frustrating. Like I know people are probably watching me like, but it's so I know it is. I know it is. It's it's but you know, everybody's on their, their soul journey too. And part of the this is coming out of that. Now, Kelly, at what point did you I know you're still in, in aspects of healing, but at what point did you feel like you were finally do you was there a day where you finally realized you had fully stepped away or did it come gradually where you finally were like, I'm, I can see this for what it is now. Yeah, I think that came really gradually. I don't think there was any one moment. I think the more interviews I do, the more I write about it, the more I speak about it, the more I realize I'm okay, but we're all kind of okay <laughs> anyway. And I think that, we believe sometimes that we're not. And so my healing process is really just my journey, like my life journey, right? Um, when I came out of, of Nixium, I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust anyone. I didn't want to have anything to do with anything. And 
then I realized after a period of time, I was still a seeker. Like I still want the answers. I still want to be a better person. I still want to grow. I still want to do all these things. So I'm right back where I started again. However, I'm not looking outside myself this time. When I went into Nixium, I was looking to someone else or something else to fix me. Now I've learned that's never going to happen. I look inside myself for my answers. Yes, I'll go out and ask questions and decide, does this make sense for me? I'll use my critical thinking skills and say, is this the right thing for me? Does it resonate with me? My intuition, does it resonate with me? If it doesn't, I throw it out. If it resonates with me, I take it in and apply it however that makes sense for me. But I never look to anyone else for my answer ever again. That's how it's different, but I'm still a seeker. I still well, I believe, faith. I still have faith. Because you're not broken. You, there's nothing not, to fix. Yeah. No one, you know, that you're not, you're, you're a whole souled person. You're having a human experience. I was going to ask you about that because I found that with myself when I started going through trauma therapy, which for me, trauma therapy, like I, I always say at this point, I'm really grateful for the experience that I had because I loved mm -hmm. trauma. Trauma therapy really changed me. Mixed with my yoga practice, it really, that was a mm -hmm. pivotal moment for me. Um, but there was a time period where I didn't trust anyone. I was constantly looking at people with a very critical eye, looking for the next narcissist. Um, I really, any new people that came in, this was long before I had a YouTube platform. I was very like that the emoji where she's like this, like I was very, you know, and I was like, <laughs> why did that person say they liked my shirt? You know, I was looking for like love bombing everywhere because I was so sensitive. Did, did you go through, is that, that's why it's probably normal. Did you go through that as well, Kelly, where you were very- Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, uh, I was looking at everything like afraid that it was a cult or afraid that this person was a little culty. Now I look through the lens of my whole life as, as not looking for a cult, but my whole lens now involves that part of what we're talking about, that intuition and that gut feeling and does it resonate and everything else, which is the same tool. Those are the same tools I would look at if I were looking at something, is it a cult? So for example, I don't go out looking for it, but my lens is always open to see the flags that would indicate that something's not right, that it, it could be culty or that it's, um, you know, narcissistic or that it's um, something that's trying to control me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. And I was going to say, because every body is different. So for people watching right now, like for me, what you're saying, because you do, I did obviously come down from that. And now, now I know for me, I, I know what to f I feel in my body. Do I feel like I have to walk on eggshells? That's one thing I, mm -hmm. I looked at my nervous system to tell me mm -hmm. whether this is no good. Um, do I feel like I'm walking on eggshells? Do I feel like I am obligated to a certain organization or person. I look, those are the two things for me that for my sense of self, I know is being tested again or pushed back into feeling obligated because it's an empathic person. You know, you have the, nar the, real di the dichotomy between the narcissist and the empath. So that's mm -hmm. basically what you're looking at with any type of abusive relationship. You've got the Keith Raniere narcissist with all his little empaths around him, you know, mm -hmm. and in a abusive relationship, you've got the narcissist and the other lover, the other person is the empath. And so as an empath, you are feeling a heightened sense of emotion. And so you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so sometimes I think that need to not want to hurt somebody else filters through you being a little bit too accommodating to somebody who could then abuse that from you. And so mm -hmm. what are things with you, Kelly, like what are certain things that you notice within your nervous system, within your 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 psyche when something doesn't feel right like what's a telltale sign for you so when something doesn't feel right i always feel it sort of in my gut i feel it in my stomach but i have made a huge practice of constantly being aware not hyper vigilant just being aware being aware of my responses or my reaction my reaction am i reacting or am i responding is this person um trying to um, control me or am I feeling that they're trying to control me? Is it me or is it them? It's like, it's, I'm in a constant state now of awareness of my own behavior, right? Because that's the only important part, because if you're aware of your own behavior, then you can decide where you want to go and what you don't want to go. So if I am aware that I need to belong, right? I have this need, everyone has a need to belong. That, that's a human thing. But if I'm feeling today, like, Bryce, I really need to belong here talking to you. 
if I'm aware of that need, then I can be aware of when I'm doing things that go against myself in order to try to belong with you. Does that make sense? And if I'm aware of that, I'm willing to, to say certain things, do certain things, whatever, in order to belong. And I'm aware of that, then I can say, wait a minute, I'm not going to react by doing these things. I'm going to respond by doing what's right for me. And that might be saying no, or it might be deciding to do something else. Mm -hmm. So aware, for me, it's all about awareness and watching myself respond to things or react to things or do things out of either fear or some kind of need that isn't healthy. Does that I make sense? That. Yes, I love okay. that. And I love and that's something too. like, when we look at like toxic relationships versus mm -hmm. healthy relationships. And this is in any relationship, guys, this could be your employer, this could be your best friend, your lover, your kid, your sibling, whatever. In a healthy relationship, there are healthy boundaries. I didn't even know what a damn boundary was until I went to drama therapy. I was like, what's a boundary? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, you know, and so when you have healthy boundaries, like a healthy relationship, there's a mutual respect of, of the, these healthy boundaries of not forcing mm -hmm. people to do something that they maybe don't want to do of not, you know, not trying to control the other person of if, if, if your friend says, No, I don't want to do that of being respectful and be like, cool. All right, next time, we'll try something else. You know, like, you know, it, there, there's a healthy response. There's no, you know, and that's, that's that tango between the narcissist and the empath, because mm -hmm. the narcissist is getting what they call narc supply from mm -hmm. so Keith Rainier, for Keith Raniere. It, all of the people in Nexium were basically his drugs. Those were his, mm -hmm. he was getting his sense of self from the accolade of the empaths that were getting, having themselves reflected back to them with Keith. So you're right, Kelly, like there mm -hmm. is nothing outside of you because everything you thought that was whole about this person was actually your own self being reflected back to you anyway, you know, and that's why... Yeah narcissists can chameleon like he they can say you know you told me he was good with um like like with repertoire like he could kind of mimic you instead of being himself with everybody mm -hmm. he kind of mirrored who he was talking to 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 gain that trust that wasn't mm -hmm. really there if that makes sense right and you know people stopped giving themselves permission to take care of themselves when they were in Nixium, right? They, they didn't have permission to do what they knew was right for themselves. And permission is a huge thing. Like when you don't give yourself permission to be okay or to do what's right for you or to, to listen to your intuition, like it, that's huge. So awareness and giving yourself the permission to do that is, is the, those are the two things that I think for me have been the biggest, have, have had the biggest impact in my healing was I, those two you're, you're talking about to take care of, i was thinking about season one of the vow i think it was bonnie who was giving her schedule of what she had to do in a day mm. oh yeah i mean i would have i mean she ended up having health problems because of it but if you guys watch the vow you'll see that but i i mean just to be able to say like if you're being run ragged to say no i mm -hmm. need to sleep mm -mm. Mm -mm. we didn't give ourselves permission to do that because it was we were told we weren't allowed to so allowed to, but that's, it wasn't even saying we weren't allowed to, I'm sorry, that's the wrong word. It was, we were told that if we allow ourselves to do that, then we are somehow weak, not measurable. We're not putting in what we need to put in. So we were constantly second guessing ourselves. We're not doing enough. So we never gave our permission, ourselves permission to eat enough or to sleep enough or to take care of ourselves. We took that away. And whenever you don't give yourself permission for what your body or self needs, you know, you're in a situation of being controlled by oh. something outside of yourself. Absolutely. And that is, I, I think we've all touched, uh, you know, been, I mean, my, so my ex used to, cause I would get up uh, early in the morning to go to my sort like four o'clock in the morning. So he would play loud music in the house all night. Cause they do that self sabotaging to me or not self, but sabotaging on you to make you even more miserable when you have to get up and go teach Mysore, you know, and I would have to get up early in the morning to go to work, to go teach um, with the early morning Mysore program. And so I would be up all night hearing this blaring music. And then, yeah. And, and just to, they'll, they'll do things like that to keep you into, into their control. And you think about like, well, what would a Keith have done if you had said no, what would my ex have done if I just gone and plugged the, the music, you know, and said, I need to sleep. I have to go work in the morning. I have to go teach. I have to go adjust yeah. people. I can't be tired when I'm, I can hurt someone, you know? And I, I laugh because I always say like my, my yoga teacher in India is like the least culty of any yoga. Cause mm -hmm. like, 
<laughs> because he wants you to literally leave the mice room and go to bed and just sleep all day. Yeah. Like he doesn't want because he's so worried <laughs> that you're not because we're up so early in the morning. He's so concerned that people are not getting enough sleep that he'll be like, yeah. "You go, you go home, go to sleep." Actually, like, he's very concerned. I'm like, he's uh, he definitely is not not doing these things to bring you away. But even in like the, what Bonnie was going through, what I talked about with my ex, these toxic relationships will bring the victim to a place of not mentally being able to make rash mm -hmm. decisions either. And so if you have right. someone in your life that's going through that, you have to understand they're being sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. They're being gaslit to the point like, like Kelly, you kind of started gaslighting yourself. Oh, with the yeah. help. You know, you kind of take over and start, you know, I used to, I, I've done that. I have to catch myself. Like, don't gaslight yourself, you know, like, yeah, you know what you know, you know what you saw, you know what you experienced. Um, and we gaslight ourselves all the time when we don't listen to our intuition, right? Our intuition is coming up saying, X, Y, Z, and we're telling it, oh, is that real? I'm not really, is, I don't know. And so we're constantly doing that just with our, our negative thoughts about ourselves. So that's gaslighting. It's like, totally. you know what your reality is and you're, it, you're, you're changing the reality of really what's happening by telling yourself it's not or that you're not good enough, whatever. It's, it's all a version of that. Absolutely. It's not direct gaslighting in the sense of somebody actually trying to change your reality but you with your thoughts can do the same thing by minimizing what you see things like that so it's yeah. just it's really important to listen to that what your gut and because you know we know we all know what's right for us absolutely all the time and I will say too I'm thinking about it as well like I was thinking about there was with my ex I reason why I got, str I got strangled because I, I found out he was cheating on me and I confronted him, but I'd found a letter that he had written to another woman. That was a love letter that he, had, he hadn't mailed yet. And when I confronted him with them, he first told me that it was a trick. He was tricking me to see if I would, see there. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. gaslight. That, that's changing the situation. Mm -hmm. But by the time you've been mm -hmm. so mentally un abused, you go, Oh my God, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm a terrible person. He wanted to see if mm -hmm. I would read it. When it was sitting on the kitchen table, maybe I am a terrible person. And when literally, no, it was a love letter written to an, it was, it was what it, it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's exactly. And when we start to like, not believe our own reality, because somebody says it's different and you know, that, that also is a process, you know, people have to understand and try not to judge when someone's in that place where they're willing to really judge or let somebody else change their reality. It's because they've already been worn down to a place where they don't, they're no longer listening to their intuition. They no longer trust themselves. And so that's a process and not everybody gets there all at one time. So that's where the judgment comes in. It's like, instead of saying that's a bad thing, just like, well, you, just understanding that happens and be able to have some compassion and empathy for what if I were like that? It's like, try that person on and say, what if I were like that? What if that had happened to me? How would I react? What would I do? You know, I might do that or I might not, but I might. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, 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 and it's so funny, Kelly, because I, I, we were talking on the phone earlier, and we we're talking about the complexity of humans. When I was in trauma therapy, after I went through everything, um, we talked a lot about with my therapist, she would talk to me a lot about being codependent and independent. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And a lot of times we as humans will label people as just codependent or independent. But she explained to me and she said, Bryce, in all in all factors of your life, you are incredibly independent. You get on airplanes and fly to India by yourself. You do all these things. You don't need people with you when you do these crazy life things. Like, But in this one area, you're totally codependent. But you as an overall yes. self are not. And so this is where the complexity comes in with people. Because yes, mm -hmm. at this same time I'm going through this, where I'm believing the lies about a love letter, I'm also getting on an airplane by myself and flying to the other side of the world. No problem. Right. So so in the situation of the your your ex partner, you believed you needed him to be okay in that part of your life, but the rest of your life you were okay knowing that you were enough for that part of your life to do whatever you needed to do. And that's where I talk about if you need anything, it's like an attachment, right? When we have attachments where we have to have whatever it is to be okay, then that thing that we think we need to be okay is actually hurting us. It's holding us back. It's keeping us from reaching our goals. It's keeping us from 
you know, having joy, whatever it is. So that's where awareness comes in. Do I need this thing to be okay? Do I have to have, you know, whatever to be okay? Yeah. And you're totally right. That's exactly because it's, and in that moment when you think you need something, when a person mm-hmm. is in place where they think they need something, mm-hmm. they won't question it. They right. will believe the lies versus the truth because there's a need there they think is real. And um, they need to be okay. I need this thing to be okay. If I don't have this thing, I'm not going to be okay. You would have left him if you thought you were going to be okay. Right. You didn't leave him until you realize that somehow I'm going to be or going to have to find a way to be okay without this. I will tell you too, I... um when when at first all happened and this is kind of goes back again to that idea with the why it was so hard for people to leave keith ranieri everything that had happened with my ex they um i people had said you need a restraining order you need a restraining order and i was like no 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 it's not that serious no i don't want to yeah. do that to him i don't want to you know no 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 you know mm. i don't want to do i don't want to hurt him well right. after many many months i was back in india and I got an email that a judge had just granted me a restraining order without me even asking. Like the, the basically he said, he said, no, I'm going to, you cannot contact this person anymore. And then I found out I had recorded towards the end. I started rec- kind of like Keith Renier. I started recording <laughs> some of the conversations we were having. I just, Georgia is a one party state. So only one party has to be aware that I'm, I'm recording. And I kind of did something. I kind of feel like I got I got a little... This is when I started to gain my power back. At this point, my ex was in a legal battle with his daughter. And I sent the, his ex-wife all of the recordings. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, oh. apparently, he can't see his daughter anymore without, without supervision. Oh. So, <laughs> I feel like I yeah. got, got my power back in that a little bit, you know. Yeah. You know, that kind of gave me that little oomph to, to take my power back and, and protect his daughter as well. But, um, yeah. but you no, know, it's it's these people that are like this, if it's a narcissist, and neither Kelly nor I therapist, but it just in, in general, if this is a narcissist, this is a psychopath, they are not going, that's one thing my therapist said to me too, is when you are, t- when you are traditionally a healthy minded person, now when I say a healthy minded person, I don't mean that you're without any struggles or anything like that. I mean that you, you, you have empathy, you have compassion. You are never going to understand the workings of an, of a toxic mind. You're never going to be able to reason and justify the workings of someone who is not healthy minded, which would be a narcissist or a psychopath. And so their reasons for, and I think that's what you're grappling with as well, because you would never do something like this. You would never try to control someone. You would never want to hurt anybody or scam anybody or, or keep anybody busy all day so they don't get sleep or brand someone. That was why it was so hard to imagine that was his intent. Like, because there was, there was what was happening, the reality of really what was happening. We were being, you know, asked to do all these things, but we thought it was for, we were being told it was for our own good to grow and become more measurable and accountable. So I couldn't imagine how somebody's intent could be to control us. Even though I was feeling a bit controlled at, at many times, I always thought, oh, I'm, you know, it's for my own good, et cetera. I never thought someone would actually do that. Yeah. I just couldn't wrap, wrap my head around it. So even you when- you never do Keith, it. No, you because when- never. They, No, and when Keith came through, like the whole thing with Keith is evil and went back out again, it was like, oh, he couldn't possibly, that I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Yeah. yeah. No, I can. But. And that's a big thing too. When you're looking at it, if you're if you yourself are coming out of an abusive situation, or you know somebody who's in it, you have to understand that that person is viewing this abuser through the lens of their own reality, and so they are questioning their own reality because they would never treat someone the way that they've been treated, and so they're trying to justify it. Right? Mm-hmm. They're trying to justify why this person why? is doing this. Right? Like Keith Raniere, oh, he's doing this to help us. When reality, no, he was doing it because he's a psychopath, right? He, he, it was yeah. all about that. Um, and that takes a long time, doesn't it? It takes a long time to process that this person isn't good. It took me a long time to process that my ex wasn't good, that he was a well, bad the, person. The thing is, is that we can't actually envision what it would be like to be like a person like this, like what they could actually be. Thinking. But we also, what I had to determine for myself was that there are people out there that are like this, even though I don't understand it, even though I can't actually imagine doing this, 
I had to wrap my head around that there are people out there that will do this. And that was really hard for me because then you have to really admit there is, there's evil out there. And that was hard for me. I didn't want to look at that. But now I know there is. I still don't want to know what it feels like or how they see things. But I have to admit that they're out there. And I have to be aware of them. And I will tell you, Kelly, I don't know if I told you this on the phone or not. Um, 50, so the Cassiopeians say that 50% of the Earth is made up of organic portals. People who don't have their upper chakras. And these people can be influenced very easily by negative fourth density beings. Mm -hmm. The closer you come to self-realization, the closer you come to enlightenment, the more organic portals are sent to you to try to derail you. So (laughs) great. (laughs) Again, I'm going to have to speak to the manager of of when I die. I'm going to, I want to speak to the manager because somebody allowed me to come back here. I'm like, was that really in my highest good? Um, I'm going to be the Karen of the of the cosmos and be like, let me speak to the manager about the situation. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, this was not the deal. Um, <laughs> nobody's in as a manual. So I want people to be aware of that as well from a spiritual, which we talk a lot about the spirituality on, on, on this channel as well. And Kelly and I, we've talked a lot about spirituality off offline too. When you are on a path of, which makes sense to me when I look back at my time with my ex, I was on a hardcore path. I was going to India. I I was on the road to becoming the only female authorized in the state of Georgia. It was a big deal. So obviously a big wrecking ball was sent in to try to derail that, right? Mm -hmm. With you, Kelly, same thing. Now, the beautiful thing about my dog is agreeing. Now, the beautiful (laughs) thing is that that if you are a soul, let me just shut the door. (laughs) <laughs> my dog is the sheriff of the neighborhood how dare another <laughs> person walk by my house how dare a dog be on the bushes outside um but if you're a sold person and you make it through you survive a wrecking ball like keith Rainier. i mean not only have you pissed the darkness off even more but you yourself are a freaking badass because you took that bullet and you healed and you you used it right you used it to even bet to what the devil what do they say what the devil will make for bad god will use for good you know you use that friction to better yourself you know to make yourself even more accessible as a i, I consider you to be a healer kelly honestly like i think that's in your dna is that you are a light worker you are a healer you're a reiki master this was something that could have if you had not been made of the substance that you're made of as a soul, this could have just totally obliterated. Oh. Mm-hmm. But it, and do you feel like, do you feel secure in that, that you're like, I am freaking Wonder Woman. Like I, mm-hmm. I the devil, I met him. I met him at volleyball. <laughs> no, I met him at volleyball. I love that. I did meet him at volleyball. Um, I don't feel like a badass. I feel like I'm, like every other human being out there just sort of, you know, trying to find my way. I feel like I have these experiences that have can help me to help other people. I think everybody has experience that they can turn into wisdom to look back on to help everyone. So I mean, was it Tony Robbins was saying something about, you know, he's fed a billion people through his organization, through his philanthropy. And, you know, he said it started with a couple, one or two. And every day he wakes up and he says, what can I do today in my family, in my community, in my friendship circle where I can help do, help someone be better, do better, help them. So it's little things that we do in our, in our surroundings that's going to make the world a better place. So do I feel like a badass? No, I feel like I get up every day and I struggle just like everyone else. But I do take the opportunity whenever I can, and I have the intent to always help when I can. So that's, but thank you for saying no, that, that you see me ass. that way. That she, she, she's, nice. she's got her Wonder Woman costume hidden off camera, guys. <laughs> 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 Total badass. I mean, no. it really must piss Keith off. He's got, I mean, literally Nexium was full of gorgeous women, like d- drop dead beautiful women. And now he's like sitting in prison and they're all just taking off and doing, doing their doing their thing. Themselves and like, you know, ha ha ha, wah ha ha. That's, that's a, you know, so, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking like, if I, I'm going to ask you this too kelly like if i were to give somebody advice about if they have a family friend who's in a toxic situation my advice to them would be to tell that person that you understand 
you love them and you'll be there for them whenever whenever they're ready. What would you tell somebody who's dealing with someone in their life who is in a toxic situation? I think it's to just to be patient, to stay in contact with that person as much as possible. Don't rock the boat. Um, don't uh, argue with them because the moment you argue about their reality, then you're gonna they're gonna push you away. So it's really being in a holding pattern and educating yourself about what you can do when the moment is right. So when the person asks for help, asks asks for help, or comes to you, or um, is in a situation where they're open to help, then you're ready. But you can't force someone to do something they're not ready to do. It doesn't work that way because we're all human beings. We all have rights and, and they can just not, they can just cut communication with you. So I think that's the most important thing is education for yourself. And I would say that definitely you guys watch Seduced because you kind of see that with Catherine Oxenberg yes. in India where she, Catherine kind of does push it a little too far sometimes and it causes the pullback from India. So it's, a, mm -hmm. we thank God she didn't give up because she literally got her daughter out. But, but you can kind of see that push pull dynamic with them, with her daughter stuck in this situation. So, and I will put that That's link so down difficult. below as well, because, and you want to, and I would say, so if the person comes out of a cult or out of an abusive relationship, you probably, the first thing you say is probably, you don't want to be like, I told you so, right? <laughs> no, no, never, never. Never. No, I think that what you want to do is reestablish the relationship, build the relationship, support them, help them to find the right resources as they go through this process, which it's going to be. And it's never I told you so, because even if you were to say that, you really don't know, like you haven't been through it and you don't know that you wouldn't do it. We always say we wouldn't get caught in these things, but some we do. We get caught in other things. So every human being on this planet makes mistakes, they fail. So who are we to say, I told you so, because we're failing in other parts of our lives. <laughs> I don't right. know anyone out there who isn't. If there are, I'd love to know them. Yeah, that's the, we come here, we come here for that friction. We come here, we come here to, to fail sometimes in order to grow from that, that darkness, that, that instability that comes from that experience. And, um, yeah. and that's what I love about, I'm going to share your book again on the screen here, Kelly. You guys, you guys really should oh, order you. her book um, because it's 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 the power of owning your story without shame or blame, and that's kind of what we're kind of talking about here as well. Is that um, is that you are able to come forward and say, "Yeah, I went through this horrific thing, and it was hard, and it was complicated, and human beings are hard, and human beings are complex and complicated." And, um, and this is what I learned from the experience. And so I would absolutely, you guys, I will put this down in the um, description box below um, to understand. And especially we're, we're at such a peculiar time in our world mm. history right now with we've got so much going on on both sides of the coin and, and every and I'm over here like let's just go over here and do our own thing like ignore them um you know <laughs> and there's, a, there's a lot of friction in our lives and it's it's interesting for the first time I'm, I'm, I'm 40 so the first time in my life I'm seeing a time period where it's almost like you're really seeing this aggressive idea of cult really everywhere because mm -hmm. people, I mean, when I were, when I was a kid and maybe social media is to blame for this, people were friends with all sorts of people. Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans were friends. Christians and Buddhists were friends, you know, and it wasn't that big of a deal because we all had our, there was beauty in our differences. And now it look, it seems like people are so obsessed with having people agree with them 100% Mm -hmm. that there is no room for discussion. There is no room for un discernment, understanding, and non-judgment. And so, um, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. So mm -hmm. be be the yeah. person that you want to see in the world, that person that's going to lend a, a helping hand to a human being that's distressed. Because all those labels, everything we have in our world, those are just mm -hmm. illusions anyway. That's just an yeah. illusion anyway. So you are a sold person and you are here on this timeline with all these other beautiful souls. You all, whether you believe it or not, I know I believe it. You all came down here together to do this together. So, yeah. so see that beauty in someone, see, see this, the, and, and that pain, you know, that thing about people coming out of a situation like Nexium, the Ashtanga practice, which Kelly's been doing is very hard and can be very painful. And David Grieg, my original teacher, David Grieg, asked Guruji once in conference, Guruji, is, is this pain necessary? And he said, yes, because pain is real. 
-hmm. it's real. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or black or white or Asian or female or male or whatever, gay, straight, doesn't matter. Pain is real. And that's yeah. something we can all relate to each other. We know what it feels to have our heart broken. We know what it feels to lose somebody. I mean, we talked about that last time. You know, you you had this amazing group of people around you. And I say that in all sincerity because they seem like pretty amazing people. Besides yeah, Keith, many. you know, you just bop Keith out and you've got like a beautiful commune, you know, <laughs> like we did. Yeah. Uh, and it, and, that, and that, that, that sincerity is still there because these were yeah. sold beautiful people that wanted to do good and evil just got involved. And, mm -hmm. and that pain is real for everyone. And to be empathetic towards people who are going through that. And yeah. I know for me, Kelly, I, I, I don't know what you would say, but I would say if you are someone coming out of an abusive situation, whether it's a relationship or a cult, definitely take some time to be with yourself on purpose, be with yourself. Mm -hmm. to get and to be that. kind, be kind to yourself. And yeah. it, it, it's, it's, um, it's hard to do, but if you can be kind to yourself and kind to other people, that's, I start, it's so funny. I always start, you know, when I'm feeling really uh, having a bad day or I'm just feeling, I'm like, who can I help? Who can I call? Who can I reach out to? What can I do? I find if I can be kind to someone else, then I find it easier to be kind to myself. It should be the other way around, but I find that it really helps to be able to reach out and do something, get yourself out of yourself and be kind. That is the transmission of energy because energy cannot be, can, can neither be created nor destroyed. It just is. And so mm -hmm. what the only thing you can do is trans is transmute it. And you're right. That's so beautiful. Like when you're having those days where you just want to punch a hole in the wall, mm -hmm. go out and buy someone lunch, you know, yeah. go, you know, go, even, or if you can't afford that, go find someone and tell them they look beautiful in their dress mm -hmm. or, you know, it's, it's, um, there's, um, oh, it makes me emotional. Mm -hmm. There's this great slideshow that's been going around the internet for a while now. And this photographer pulls people in and he has them sit down and he sets his camera up and he takes a picture of their still face. And then he says, you're beautiful. And just to see their smile, it makes me so oh, emotional talking about it. Yeah. He just says, you're beautiful. And he sees their smile, you know, just to tell somebody something that yeah. kind, yeah. it changes everything, you know, yeah, and, it really does. And, and those that, are the things I'm talking about. That's how we change our world. It's, you know, you do it a little at a time, whatever you're capable of doing. If everyone did that, our world would change. And so it's, yeah, there's, there's so many levels of, of us as human beings and what we can do. But again, it goes back to awareness. You're constantly aware of what's going on with yourself and who you want to be. Because when you're aware, then you can decide who you want to be. And when you're aware, you decide who you want to be. And then you decide how you want to respond instead of react. It all kind of goes back to that all the time. And that's and that's the witness as well. We, you're great at that, Kelly, yes. being able to witness versus experience. And that's oh, amazing. Well, guys, I know it's, I could talk to you forever, Kelly. I could just keep you on Zoom. We I know it's so fun. The forever. Best. <laughs> I can't wait to like see you in person one day. I will have to, I feel so blessed and I'm so grateful to you, Kelly. And I feel so blessed on my channel. All these people that I, you know, got in touch with to do shows with have truly become friends. And I consider you such a good friend at this point. I feel like oh, I've known you. Me too. And Tamara, I saw Tamara, which now you know Tamara. I saw her. I was like, I know that girl. I saw Kelly. I was like, I think I know her. I think <laughs> I think we signed the same soul contract <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, I think I remember her. We were like, do we really have to do this? Like, do we really have to that place? No. Um, and I'm so grateful to call you my friend. And you are. And I'm. I'm so. And I mean this in all sincerity. I know we'll probably be talking about Nexium for a few more episodes, but I can't wait to you. You're not just Kelly from the cult. There's so much more to you that I've gotten the pleasure of getting to know over over these past few months that there's your Reiki master you've got all these these stories these experiences that are have nothing to do with Nexium, and I can't wait for the world to get to see that side of you as well and oh, um, I know you. um guys I, I want to do I have this idea and I've talked I've spoken to Jamie as well my Olympiad friend of having a panel with Kelly Catherine and Jamie because Jamie and Kelly have that in common where they went through a huge traumatic event publicly <laughs> <laughs> I laugh like publicly they had to go through it publicly whereas a lot of us go through this stuff privately and to have that 
that conversation about what that's like to have, uh, you know, with Jamie with her the Olympic experience that she went through at like 24, super young, mm -hmm. you know, and where that propelled her in life. And then I also, I would love to have you talk about your Reiki at some point as well and get into like yeah. the, 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 the woo woo because the woo woo <laughs> is the most fun. <laughs> We'll go total anti nexium and we'll go right. <laughs> there we go. We'll That'll go, be fun. Screw your data. Screw your data. We're going to go right into the cosmos. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, once again, guys, I'm going to put a link to Kelly's book, her social media as well. And um, and if you guys have any questions for Kelly, leave them in the comment section below and we will um, we'll address them because we, I mean, one of my favorite Ram Dass quotes is we're all just walking each other home. Yeah. So, we're doing. I love that. Yeah, I love that quote. Black I love Ram Dass. I know, me too. You know, it's so funny. He died in December of 2019 at a very, he's a very old guy. He's very old age. He lived a very long life. And I think that son of a gun, he was like, he saw 2020 coming and he was like, he's out. He died like in December of 2019. <laughs> and he, yeah, I think he saw it coming, but, or maybe not, but uh, it was his time. But boy, I would have loved to have met him. That is one person I would have loved to have met. And he wasn't a guru. He was simply a teacher. And he resonates so much with me. And I go out and get, I use his tools all the time. And they resonate with me. Yeah, He's amazing. Ram Dass, I, I, I agree with love. you. I think that I think he had gone through enough friction where his soul mm -hmm. didn't need to experience 2020. And he left a lot yeah. of us with very valuable tools yes. that he had learned from his teacher, his his guru in India, in order for us to be able to move forward with these ancient teachings in a very, he talked, talk about somebody. I mean, this was a guy who was Harvard educator, or Harvard teacher, very smart, but mm -hmm. he spoke to every single person like they were equal to his intelligence and that, and from a very humble place, talk about someone who, who, who held compassion for humanity. He didn't judge yeah. others. He didn't look down on others. You know, he, it, he was brilliant at what he did. He was a very enlightened soul. And so, yeah, I always quote him. We're all, one of my other favorite quotes is treat everybody like they're God dressed in drag. In drag. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I was just going to say that one. Yeah. I love that. And he said, the other one I really love is, um, if you think you're enlightened, just go spend a week with your family. <laughs> so that is like the ultimate testing ground, right? <laughs> if you think you're enlightened. I mean, he was just, he had the best, the best, he was the best. Yeah. And I, I, you know, what you do? I'll do it in the description box, guys. There is a YouTube channel full of Ram Dass's teachings. If mm -hmm. I will, I will put that down in the description box as well. Cause sometimes I'll just play a playlist of him, especially if I'm having a bad day, especially if I'm, you know, he just had such a way of, 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 of um, he always, he would, he would quant, uh, quote the Hanuman, which I have Hanuman right here, the Hanuman from the Ramayana where Hanuman would say, when I forget who I am, I serve you. When I know mm -hmm. who I am, I am you. Yes. And that's what, that's that we, we are each other. We are yeah. one soul collective consciousness here on this earth. And that makes me emotional too. When I forget who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. And you. That, yeah. you know, that, that transcends race. It's transcends Everything. Gender. It transcends religion. It transcends po politics because those are just forms of the illusion of the matrix. Anyway, we are sold people that, that have energetic and, and emotional responses. And that's what we have to understand about each other and not judge each other because at the pure essence of our soul is unconditional love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kelly. You're always so, I, you're just so gorgeous. You're just so beautiful. Oh you're so sweet. <laughs> yeah, so are you. Oh my gosh. And it's just been such a pleasure getting to know you and call you my friend. I know. I can't it's wait so to awesome. hang out in LA with you. I want, so I, 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 you're doing Ashtanga. I want, what I want to do one day when I come back out to LA, I want to go take a bar class with Marnie Alton with you. Talk okay. about a woman that will get you girl power, will get you feeling. <laughs> I want to go take that bar. Cause I mean, I just, I'm like, I want, I want you to meet. I want, I, I, I she's really cool. I was like, I didn't just get love it. Two cool, two cool ladies. Like, to, so. <laughs> I love it. Um, anyway, well, I love you girl. And I cannot wait love to do more. Too. We will, we will have way more episodes. You guys, I hope that was helpful. Again, be, be patient and kind with yourself. It's uh, as my, as my algebra teacher said in high school, no one gets out of this world alive. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we all got our own shit to bear. So, so no judgment here. So, all right, you guys, we will all, we'll talk to you later. Bye everybody. Bye.